Welcome to Wider Lens, a podcast brought to you by the Directors Guild of Canada in Ontario. And I'm your host, Annie Bradley, writer, director, and chair of DGC Ontario. I think we all are evolving and transition is just another way to to identify how we change over time. So I just watched this extraordinary new show called Sort Of. What are you hoping will happen? They just keep being the way you are and everything's magically gonna change? I'm a nanny. Like Mary Poppins? So this is the show about Sabi, who is a trans-feminine millennial who works for a family that sustains a tragedy. And Sabi makes a choice to give up a dream to be there for the family. So today, I'm really excited because I'm getting a chance to talk to the creators Fab Filippo and Bilal Bag. Not only did Fab and Bilal come together to create the show, but Bilal is also starring as the lead character, Sabi, in the series, sort of. So I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, the podcast today. I am speaking with uh, creators Fab Filippo and Bilal Bag um, in regards to their wonderful uh, series, which you can see on CBC Gem and soon on HBO Max, called Sort Of. Um, so welcome. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks for having You're us. You're very welcome. So I think that everybody loves an origin story. Um, and I think yours is probably more unique than most people's. So I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about how sort of came to be. <laughs> do you want to do that, Fab? Okay, I'll do it. Um, um, I guess it was, what, what 2018, uh, maybe? Uh, Bilal and I were both actors in a play at the Tarragon Theatre. Um, a play called Theory by Norman Young and um, we were both uh, we both had a lot of time off stage and uh, and we were back backstage together with our laptops open tapping away and so we both noticed that we were also writers and um, and you know uh, it, it just kind of started with um, I was kind of the elder of the cast and, you know, I was sort of interested in what Bilal was doing. And I think I had myself felt stuff uh, in the industry about the pressure to change your voice, you know, um, if, if only just to make a living, not, you know, uh, and Bilal, I felt was sort of at the beginning of what they were doing. And, and I kind of offered, you know, don't, you know, I remember a conversation about saying, sort of, don't, don't change your voice because uh, uh, it's super important. And then, and then I think that opened some stuff and we kind of th started throwing ideas back and forth. And uh, we have, we have, we have still, I guess, we have this other idea that never kind of saw the light of day, which the more I think about it, the more it's like, it's it, uh, really expensive to make. Uh, but, um, <laughs> Um, and then this idea came about and I think it was kind of me just saying, I think, you know, what if we built this show around sort of somebody who is close to you in your life? And Bilal said, well, why would I, why would I make that with you? And... And I was like, yeah, this is a really good question. I don't know. I have no answer to that. And then, so I went away and I sort of thought about it a little bit. I was also going through a tricky time in my life, um, uh, end of a marriage, rethinking kind of a lot of stuff about my own place in the world, my my identity. And, and I came back to Bologna and I said, what if this is a story uh, about how everyone is in transition? And that, you know, every transition is different. Every transition is seen differently in the world. Every transition is accepted differently, you know. Uh, and Bilal really responded to that. Like, it's almost like the project, I could start to see it after we started to talk about transition. And, and one of the things I was craving well before Fab came into my life was wanting cis and straight and 
people of all ages and um, skin colors to be using that word because to me it's always felt like a, a really human word and I think we all are evolving and transition is just another way to to identify how we change over time and and moment by moment and and I, I think it was in Fab being vulnerable too like I, I had also gotten to this place in my life where I was so done being the vulnerable traumatized artist and it wasn't even something I really wanted I feel like it just kind of happened that way when you feel like you're writing from a place of truth but maybe it's perceived as um, this like autobiographical like you know um, journey of trauma and 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 I, I just appreciated that that fab was able to be vulnerable with me and and, and share himself um, and that that helped me to share myself too and then it really felt like this collaboration which I also um, was really interested in and I, and I and I think as soon as we started to really um, let these ideas flow between each other it, it became really clear to me that we have an opportunity to present a character like Sebi in a really honest way which isn't focused on their body or whether they want to medically change themselves or how sad they are because they're brown and trans like it just it never was that and and I think when you're asking about what it is I, I may have wanted to say through the show I think a big thing was just to let's let these characters be and let's watch them as they evolve and, and before us and what might that do for us um, in our own journeys if we if we start to see people I think kind of beautifully subtly shift versus so, so much of the narrative particularly for trans and non-binary folks is that our evolutions are these huge sweeping kind of um, epic journeys of, of body transformation or and it's not always the case and that is true totally to some degree but I, I was just curious about so many people in my circles are, are they're thinking more about like how do I pay rent and not when when do I change my body and anyway I don't know what I'm talking about now but there was some there was just something about uh, 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 bringing a realness to to these characters and going for truth over everything versus relying on 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 certain ideas that are already out there so just let me because I think a lot of people are curious about it so you get together and you come up with this idea and you start working together and you feel like you you're having this energy, you start to have this idea for a show. At what point did you absolutely, you know, I know Sienna Films was involved eventually. At what point did you think this was really potentially going to happen? How did that, how did the next phase happen? Well, we, we shot a sizzle in the fall of 2019, so a year kind of after Fab and I met, and at that point Sienna was on board, and that was like a real, like for, for me especially, like the first taste of what it could mean to work on something, like the, the, the filming part of the, of the TV journey, and, but even after that, like, I, I don't know, I don't know if Fab, you and I have even talked about this, but I, I really, I was pretty doubtful until we were kind of green lit that this was gonna take off because it just, it almost felt too good to be true. Like things were so smooth, like between Fab and my collaboration, then Sienna Films just totally got the, the, the politics of the show and the, the, like the values and, and we're bringing that to, to it too. And so that felt kind of seamless and yeah, it wasn't really, really until we were in like the office of CBC and meeting with the executives and them literally saying, we will green light this, where I was like, oh, this is real now. But everything up until that point, I, I don't know. I think it's part of probably our artist brains too, or at least mine, that this like in, in, in immense doubt until, until somebody literally says, no, we believe in this and here's a lot of money, you know. I just have to talk about one of the wonderful things about the show, which I love, which was your wardrobe. <laughs> okay, so I love the dress at the party. 
<laughs> I loved all the dresses, but I love. But I just wonder if you could talk a little bit. Did you work with the uh, the wardrobe designer? Did you did you have like did you just talk about things and did you was it a, a really strong collaboration and how did that how did that all transpire? Totally, it was totally collaborative. Can I tell you a little funny story about that party dress Please do. in particular? <laughs> It was, you know, it, it, we, a schedule was a total thing. And I said we had a lot of looks and we were, you know, it was one of those things where we actually had tried on a couple different options for the dress and nothing like I, I it was kind of specific, too, because one of the things about Sebi is that it's not all about fashion for them and it's not this over the top flamboyant kind of in your face style there's a mutedness and and a kind of wanting to hide in their clothes too like coats are really big for them and and when so we were talking about this dress and sexiness was definitely a part of it and then we were also thinking about Sebi's own kind of tampering with with the dress maybe they cut something off and originally there's there's that billowy kind of sleeve that that they they have and originally the concept was they that they would have both but it was something that the stream stream seamstress would have needed to kind of put together and we were kind of running out of time and we we're like okay what if we just did one sleeve <laughs> because because that feels kind of sebi-ish you know and and kind of thrown together and and it was just so great to work with with the the design team on they were so game to really like um hear me out and 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 work with me and and um and with us actually you know like myself and fab and and, and again the producers at sienna all were feeding into what the looks were and and i i, I think it was just it was a a really specific thing on non-binary a non-binary fashion look doesn't just mean throw on a skirt on a body that otherwise would not be quote unquote allowed to wear a skirt. It was, it was really this like meeting place of, of Subby's bodies and, and, and the things that would kind of make them feel good and, and was really, again, character driven, you know, and specific and different from the clothes that I actually wear, you know? And, and so it wasn't just like take Bilal's wardrobe and turn it into a TV thing. It was like, where, where, where are the specificities of Sebi's like history in, 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 in this in the in the clothes too and yeah I love I love that party look and it, it was a lot of fun to put together but it was it was definitely running around a little bit too and so it has a, its own story. But maybe you could talk about uh, what what approach you took to casting. I know that there I believe you had an open call for trans and non-binary actors to play all kinds of roles, not necessarily trans and non-binary actor roles. So what was that process like and what did you discover in that process? I mean, I love all the cast, so, but I'd love to hear about that process. I'll speak particularly to the, that open call, which we totally did have. And I think we saw like submissions from over 150 like trans and non-binary actors across the country. The way we were able to see them through to to make it as casual as possible, like just sending in videos of talking as yourself, you know, and off of that, we could kind of really get to see who these people were. And I, I think that was that was huge for me. It meant a lot because I just think that's sometimes that's the only way things can really shift is when you adapt the process to actually make space for people who haven't felt invited for a really long time versus forcing them into something rigid that might not work because they haven't auditioned five million times before or they don't know what it's like to get into a casting room or work with a casting director or something. And, yeah, I, I think the the intention was really always we knew we were creating different trans and non-binary characters, and and we also thought it would be really powerful to insert trans and non-binary bodies in parts that aren't defined by their gender in any way, and that just felt fresh, right? Like it felt like something cool that could totally live in the show, and and then it's possible because we all believed in it and put in the work to to make it happen. And it really speaks to just sort of like, you know, really not just talking about inclusivity, but actually, you know, making it a part of everything, every aspect um, um, of uh, of the project. And I think that's wonderful. And and uh, I'm just wondering, 
how that and did that that translate to when you were putting together the crew and when you were going out to you know thinking about cinematographers and you know the creative heads of departments etc uh did 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 you find that there was a response in that way too i mean i i think it's i, I we it was definitely our intention and and we we did really try to to and there are definitely a handful of queer and trans folks who are in the in the in the crew as well but it's it's a thing i think a lot about like like it's it's something you know if we can keep going with this project i think there's more to do in finding ways to to, to bring more people in I, I know mentorship kind of roles are popping up more and more and i think that's huge again in terms of redefining the sector or bringing in new new voices but yeah there there was i i think we for for what we could do also within a pandemic uh as we shot we, i think we did, really did um try our best and, and and there's more to do for sure we worked with like trans and non-binary consultants too and re yeah really it was it was to, to 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 make sure that it wasn't only in front of the camera that we were trying to make these moves and um yeah, but I think there, I think there's more to do, and I think that's okay. I think I think we we there's no way to do everything completely perfectly at all, all at once, and and I'm excited for what this can like open up, like just just in terms of also encouraging other folks to dream of what's possible in terms of career and and it, with a show like this, maybe maybe there's a it can send a message out there that you know. Um, if if you can't find a space on a, on on other projects, there might be a home here, and I think that's just that'd be really cool. I just want to add that if anybody's watching this who's thinking of getting into these industries, like our industry on the whole is is what's, what was encouraging was like how in in demand you know uh, people of color people of you know who come from diverse places are in our industry right now and it it's a really good time to break into the industry like all over the place it's it's like if you're hearing this and you want to break in like it's 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 such a good time now i just like to ask where did seven come from that marvelous marvelous creature <laughs> Amanda Cordner, who plays Seven, I, I was like, fangirling around in the theater world because she, Amanda also creates her own work, and so I had been following her career a little bit and wouldn't really talk to her, but just loved her energy and and her her mind. Like she she's got some real ideas about again the intersections of queerness and race and sexuality and. And so I, even early, early on, Fab, when we were, before we had even gotten to kind of uh, the sizzle, like uh, Amanda was in my head for, uh, just as the opposite of me in like every way. And, and, and I don't know if it was in me trying to describe Amanda to you or, but, but getting the voice of, of that character is kind of, I don't know, it felt again, seamless for us. Like there was just something fun in going like the total opposite way of, of of Sebi and then what Amanda brought to it was was just just more of that like talk about somebody who's just completely open and will try and do anything and I don't know Fab did I do you, do you recall better in terms of how Seven like emerged? Well, it, it's also I do I also remember how she turned us down because we wanted her for the sizzle reel. And the story that she tells is she was like, I don't even know what you were. I was just tired. I just finished the show. I was like, you know, and, and then we asked her a second time because we just knew, you know, and then she read it and was, was like, Oh my God. Yes. Yes. You know? And uh, so after we got, after we got picked up, you know, I remember being like, you almost didn't do this. <laughs> You said no to us. <laughs> um, but yeah, in terms of the voice, it was like, I think there were two sevens. There were the seven, there was the seven that we wrote. And then, you know, once Amanda took it, then we just were writing for Amanda. You know, we would be like, oh, this is going to sound great when she says it, you know. Um, Fab, you directed quite a few of the episodes, right? I think six out of the eight episodes. 
And I have certainly been directing during COVID. And so, um, you know, it's a very, it's a, it's a different kind of game um, being a director during COVID. And maybe you could just talk about how you created, because I know you guys had a real, uh, you had all different ages on your set and, and how did you, how did you deal with all of the, the COVID sort of limitations in regards to creativity and sort of trying to keep that set going? Yeah, it was, um, you know, it's sort of like it, it, you never know what you're going to get when you go to work that day, right? I mean, I guess it's kind of like that normally, right? But it's just like now you're kind of also on fire. Um, you know, like, one, uh, being one of the co-creators and, and co-showrunners is you're lucky because as a direct in, in the sense that as a director I was able to kind of say all right we're going into pandemic let's let that dictate the style a little bit of of the show and you know I'm not entirely sure what it would have been uh, were it not in a pandemic but I knew that no matter what our budget was, it was going to feel like we had $2 to make this, you know? And, and so I think part of the handheldness, part of the shifty focusness, you know, um, came out of the realities of, 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 of the necessities of how we were shooting. It's, it was, it's a heavy location show and, and it's a pandemic. And so, um, you just really had to think on your feet. And um, what was great was having the trust of the producers and the networks to allow us to make it work, you know? Um, and as a result, I feel like what came out was this very kind of unique, I don't know, Donald Glover call, calls it a melted sand castle. That's what he called, uh, um, um, uh, Atlanta and and I don't know what that means but I feel like we made a melted sandcastle. <laughs> I think I think so Bilal do you have do you want to weigh in on that? I mean you're on the other side of the lens. So Yeah, I mean it as somebody who was there for very long hours on set almost every day, I I, I and 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 in, interacting with so many people from crew to cast, I the fact that I felt constantly safe, I think, was a real testament, again, to the care that was being poured into to the show from literally everybody who who worked on it. And I, I it, that just feels so special. And even though that I think, yes, there was tension in, in, in producing something during a pandemic, I think... Um, there was always love, like it just felt like that. It felt like everyone was showing up to work, excited to be a part of this story and wanting to do it justice. And I think that really goes a long way. You know, it, it, it really felt like um, we could actually play because there was, we knew that everyone was taking it so seriously and that there were no cutting corners and 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 that that, you know, we had to, it was. It just felt important, or something. It felt like I, I. I. I think back on the on the filming experience a lot. Actually, it was the first time for me to be working in this way, and um, there was a, it, when it ended. There was there was a total bittersweetness because I I was so scared going into it, thinking that I was going to ruin everything, and and being on the other side of it. I just there was just so many memories of of love and laughter and, 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 and working quickly to get the thing done before the day ended. And, but it was all, yeah, it's just special. Can I also just say that just, I want to mention Jennifer Kowaja because, you know, she's the producer uh, and one of the owners of Sienna films and it's a top down game. You know, if the producer isn't bringing that, then it, you don't feel it all the way down for sure. And and she cared as much about the safety of everybody as well as the creative, you know. And I remember having conversations with her where she would be like, did you get what you wanted? 
no, no, no. Did you really get what you wanted? Do you want to reshoot it? You know, like, I'm like, what? You're, I'm like, we can do that. <laughs> you know, like, so I, I, you know, she really was there for the project and really there for us. And at the same time, you know, uh, really ran an amazing ship. And I think that really shows up. You see that love, you see that energy on the screen, you captured it. It's there. And, and as an audience member, I can tell you that I felt that, you know what I mean? Um, and it, it feels fresh. It feels new. And that's partly because it's, you know, new voices and, it, you know, new stories that we all need to see and hear. Um, I just wondered, but I wanted to say thank you so much for, um, in regards to putting the queer community landscape on the lens as well. I know that you use Glad Day Bookstore and a couple of other locations. Um, maybe you could just talk about working with Chris Crane. I believe he was your produ production designer, right? And how you wanted to bring elements of the community into, into that world. Yeah, I, I think those were also really specific conversations. Like it, it was clear to us that this wasn't going to be something uh, that the queer world in particular, and then more particularly, Bar Book, the the it, that it was uh, it 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 represented like I always talked about it like the misfits of, of the of the queer and trans community, you know the the weird that's where the weird ones go to to have their drink or read their book, and that it's not yet consumed by like the the, the kind of uh, corporate like. Uh, ways in which like queerness becomes like you know um, weaponized against its own communities like like this high end kind of thing and and I, I just think it was great to have uh, people like Chris who who got it without you know needing like deep explanations about the nuance of it all. I think that's what happens when you kind of crew inclusively, like the, 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 the nuance is there without like so much work being put in and it kind of makes things, um, I, I don't know, at least feel, feel deeper. And I, I think it was really great to see what was possible in that space because it was, it was, uh, like when we saw it, it was, um, a, a former restaurant or something that had closed down because of the pandemic, and so everything that's in that location was was set and and deck and 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 uh, I mean I I think that again uh, being able to have a specific conversation about the kind of queer space that not general queer space but oh that's my cat all over me. Um, uh, that, going for something specific and having those conversations again with someone who got it uh, was just exciting and you worked you brought in on the team you had a trans consultant filmmaker chase joint and and a therapist and i just wondered if you could just talk a little bit about that um you know what that process was like but also you know why you made that decision to do it and um and maybe you could just talk a little bit about that sure um yeah, Chase Joint was one of our consultants. Kai Cheng Tom was another. And then later on in the process, they were involved kind of at the script stage. And then later on, when we kind of got to editing and cutting episodes, we also brought Ronnie Ali and uh, Cole Alves. And so between the four of them, you've really got a nice kind of picture of of the different, uh, the way transness um is expressed so so differently and i think it, it started I, I remember having conversations with fab and jennifer and laura and 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 really knowing that if there weren't going to be every single kind of representation of transness in the writer's room that we needed those perspectives early early on because i i just was like i'll get crushed if i'm trying to speak to all trans experiences, it's literally impossible. No one also was expecting that of me. And so I think very quickly we knew that it was about bringing in voices that could, you know, speak to these, to the, the different experiences. And 
and um, that that's that's all that we were going for and and the invitation always to these consultants were to bring their full selves to their to their notes and that it wasn't only look at that one trans male character if you're a trans man but but like here are the stories and tell us what you're what you're seeing what you're not seeing what's working what's not working and and there have been some some of the the stuff that the consultants brought i i, I think about to this day like their viewing of of the show and you know i ronnie was somebody who actually helped me like see my see sebi in a way that i hadn't really seen them before and kind of uh um they're they're somebody who has a, a kind of practice as a, as, a, as a therapist and we're able to bring like a uh, an analysis of the psychology of the character in a way that i like wasn't thinking about and and that's just cool right like it's 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 of course to to flag what might not be working what might be potentially problematic but then also to bring your full brain and heart to it really opens up things that naturally we we might miss because we can't see it from all sides all the time you know and i remember so. reading some of ronnie's um uh, notes to us and and, and crying afterwards <laughs> <laughs> because they were just so beautiful, you know, and uh, having that and, and the conversations that would spark between Bilal and I and then and the writing room. It, and, you know, it was a it was a real gift. Bilal, can I ask you this one question? Have you did you say that you had never been in front of the camera before? I had done one very short film a couple of years ago that's like totally buried and no one will ever see it and that was that was it well then as a director i can tell you that is extraordinary because you are mesmerizing and captivating to watch you hold my heart with everything you say on screen so thank you thank you so much for taking the risk and putting yourself out there fab I can't. I'm so happy for you. Um, your work has always been a favorite of mine, but I think this is uh, a really magical melted sand castle. And on that, mm. I will say, because that's called a callback, I will say thank you so much and I wish you everything. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank Fab Filippo and Bill Albag for joining us today. This podcast was produced by Katie Jensen and Michal Stein at Vocal Fry Studios. Our video producer is John Pakman. Our executive producer is Anne-Marie Stewart. And special thanks to Aviva Cohen and Laura DiGirolamo at DGC Ontario. And I'm your host, Annie Bradley. We'll see you next time on Wider Lens.